Many people have experienced the beauty of the Nantahala and Pisgah National Forests in Western North Carolina. It's hard to believe that just 80 to 100 years ago, these were cut over eroded lands that nobody wanted. Let's take a moment to look at both the past and the present story behind today's beautiful mountain scenery. During America's early years, pioneers viewed land and water resources as wild and unlimited. People feared the vast untamed forests and considered them an obstacle to progress. Americans were encouraged to rid the land of its forests to make room for farms and settlements. Timber was more than just a natural resource to 19th century Americans, it was a way of life. For many, trees were synonymous with lumber and were there to be cut and milled. With the rapid western expansion brought on by the railroads, old growth forests that spanned the horizon were swiftly raised to the ground. Farmers, ranchers, and miners all needed clear land and enough lumber to colonize the West. Lumber companies, previously limited to the forests of the Northeast, began looking West and South. Within a few short decades, huge swaths of ancient forests were transformed into wasteland. The once vast and wild forests of Western North Carolina were quickly divested of their natural beauty. After the industry had their fill, one government official described the land as robbed of everything of commercial value. Vast areas of some of the finest virgin timber in the country were practically clear-cut. Fire followed the logging operations, destroying young timber and delaying for generations the renewal of the timber crop. Some folks, however, began to take notice. In the summer of 1873, Dr. Franklin Ho presented a paper to the American Association for the Advancement of Science titled, On the Duty of Governments in the Preservation of Forests. The chief concern was the imminent exhaustion of the natural timber resources of the United States. The group was roused into action and days later delivered a petition to Congress on the importance of promoting the cultivation of timber and the preservation of forests and to recommend such legislation as may be deemed proper for securing these objects. Congress authorized President Benjamin Harrison to set aside forest reserves and establish the Division of Forestry. These reserves were established to improve and protect the forests, to provide clear water and prevent flooding, and to provide a continuous supply of timber. This was strictly an effort to ensure the security of the nation's timber for use by later generations. Wilderness advocates like the legendary John Muir and the Sierra Club argued for the preservation and protection of these areas simply because of their natural beauty. The conservation ethic and environmentalism were still in their infancy. Within the first two years of the law, President Harrison would safeguard over 13 million acres for reasons of national security. While originally under the supervision of the Department of the Interior, responsibility for these forest reserves was given over to the Department of Agriculture, and the agency was redubbed the United States Forest Service. In 1907, the forest reserves became our national forests. Up to this point, all national forests had been created from federally owned lands in the West. But the forests in the East had also been abused, and in many cases, the lands were in much worse condition than those in the West. Soon, public outcry demanded that the federal government do something to restore the forests in the East. In 
So, in 1911, Congress passed the Weeks Act, directing the Secretary of Agriculture to examine, locate, and recommend for purchase such lands as may be necessary to protect the forests of the United States. Essentially, this gave the federal government the authority to purchase private land in order to protect and restore the watershed and timber resources in these areas. The first purchase under this new law was the 8,100-acre Curtis Creek Tract, purchased from the Burke McDowell Lumber Company. This initial acquisition cost only $7 an acre. Still used today for recreation and various other uses, the Curtis Creek Tract lies in the grandfather district of the Pisgah National Forest. Many people were selling their cut over, burned, and eroded lands, and the Forest Service was buying. In 1920, a group of lands purchased by the federal government became known as the Nandahala National Forest. In those early years, the forest ranger served as protector and guardian of the land from wildfire and trespass. These men would spend large amounts of time by themselves in the wilderness. Rangers had to be thoroughly sound of mind, able-bodied, and capable of enduring severe hardships. To become a ranger, a young man had to be able to shoot a gun, ride a horse, use an axe, pass a written test, and throw a diamond hitch. This was a knot of nearly mythical difficulty, used to tie supplies on a horse. The hours were long and the pay was low, but the Forest Service was a desirable job for many young men. The 1930s brought change. Roosevelt's Civilian Conservation Corps put the vast unemployed youth of the Depression years to work in our forests. On the Nandahala and Pisgah National Forests, CCC corpsmen worked on roads, reforestation, recreation facilities, fire towers, and more. Much of their work still served the public today and stands as a lasting tribute to their many accomplishments. During the 40s and 50s, the Forest Service focused on salvaging the tremendous amount of dead and dying chestnut timber. In those days, as much as 70% of the national forest was populated with the venerable American chestnut. Mountain folk used the decay-resistant wood for building barns and fences, while the bark was used for tanning leather. Both people and wildlife cherished the chestnuts for food. The loss of this magnificent tree to the chestnut blight remains the single greatest tragedy ever suffered by America's forest lands. By the late 50s, the lands that nobody wanted started to receive greater public attention, recreation use exploded, and the policies and practices of the Forest Service began to change. With more leisure time, people wanted to see a wider variety of recreational opportunities developed on the National Forest. However, Americans also wanted to see public lands managed in such a way that would enhance wildlife, fish populations, and biological diversity. In 1960, Congress directed the Forest Service to manage for multiple uses such as outdoor recreation, range, timber, water and fish, and wildlife. Americans were becoming more aware of the negative effects of increasing population. In 1964, Congress passed the Wilderness Act to preserve an enduring resource of wilderness. The Forest Service began looking beyond the direct benefits of a multiple-use policy. Aldo Leopold, a veteran of the Forest Service, developed a new perspective on wildlife management. Principally, he rejected the traditional notion that wildlife requires human management. Instead, 
Leopold argued that natural resource managers should look to science to restore and maintain biological diversity in the wilderness. In his book, The Sand County Almanac, Leopold eloquently describes a more nuanced management philosophy. Quote, a thing is right when it tends to preserve the integrity, stability, and beauty of the biotic community. It is wrong when it tends otherwise. This land ethic expanded the conservationalist ideals and encouraged people to think of humanity as a member of the biological community, along with the forests, rivers, plants, and animals. Concern for clean water, fresh air, and endangered plants and animals continued through the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Laws like the Clean Air Act of 1963 and the Clean Water Act of 1972 continued to build the nation's focus on environmental protection. All of this history sets the stage for what is happening on the Nantahala and Pisgah National Forest today. Some things haven't changed very much from those earlier days. For instance, a desire to protect our forests from wildfires still exists. However, the methods we use are quite different. In fact, today, not all fire in the forest is considered bad. Under certain weather conditions, the forest floor is intentionally set on fire, mimicking Mother Nature's use of lightning set fires. This prescribed burning is used to benefit wildlife, to help grow new forests, and to reduce the accumulation of fuel that can lead to devastating wildfires. Today, mountain lands that nobody wanted, the Nandahela and Pisgah National Forests, are treasured for their many recreational opportunities. People can enjoy the scenery, they can fish, hike, raft a river, and much, much more. On National Forests, people can choose whether they want to stay in a developed campground with running water, or simply camp somewhere in the woods. Specific trails have been developed for travel by horse, mountain bike, four-wheel drive, or by foot. There are short trails for easy strolls and long trails for a solitude experience in the backcountry. Many people come to seek a primitive experience in an official wilderness. Visitors to Western North Carolina's National Forest can relive the first forestry school in the United States at the Cradle of Forestry in America. Trails and displays highlight a turn-of-the-century way of life, and visitors can even climb on board a restored logging locomotive. A new Forest Discovery Center provides environmental education opportunities for all ages. Besides forest fires and recreation, today's Forest Service also cares about history. It safeguards the remains from previous human activities. Archaeologists study stone tools, pottery, and other artifacts to learn more about prehistoric and historic human cultures. By protecting archaeological sites, we help preserve our human heritage. Today, a variety of wildlife depends upon the Nandahala and Pisgah National Forests for their food, water, and shelter. Butterflies, salamanders, songbirds, woodpeckers, rabbits, and deer are just a few of the kinds of critters living in our mountain forests. The Forest Service, North Carolina's Wildlife Resource Commission, and other groups work together to improve the forest for all wildlife. The peregrine falcon was reintroduced to this area and in 1999 was removed from the endangered species list. A variety of methods are used to enhance fish populations in our mountain streams. Large blocks of undeveloped land on the Nandahala and Pisgah National Forests provide critical habitat to one of the living symbols of the Southern Appalachians, the black bear. Consideration of the health and welfare of fish and wildlife plays a critical role 
in all decisions. One of the most important resources of the Nantahala and Pisgah National Forests is its trees. Trees provide homes for wildlife, shade for mountain streams, and more. Some trees from national forests are harvested to help supply our country with the wood products that we all use. Today, efforts are concentrated on forest health and looking at the overall welfare of the forest ecosystem. The short-term and long-term welfare of the ecosystem is carefully considered before any trees are cut. Foresters, botanists, soil scientists, archaeologists, biologists, geologists, recreation specialists, and engineers all work together when planning to harvest trees. Here in the mountains of North Carolina, we are blessed with a great variety of plant communities. Pine, hardwood, spruce, fir, and even mountaintop balds all combine to make the Nandahala and Pisgah National Forests a very special place. Our forests mean different things to different people. Whether it is the wildlife that so many enjoy, the wood products we all need, the water we drink, or the recreational opportunities available, different people place different values on the various resources. There have been many changes since the days of Gifford Pinchot. Perhaps the greatest change is that of the public's role. Through recreational opportunities, the people have really gotten to know their public lands. From regular use, many have become active, informed participants in the management of the forests themselves. Countless volunteers and numerous groups contribute time and effort in maintaining and improving their local forests. Public participation has become a vital part of forest management. Managing the forest for all its valuable resources while maintaining the integrity of the entire ecosystem is the greatest challenge we face. With your help, the Forest Service is working hard to meet that challenge. So many demands on limited resources. How ironic that today there are so many wants from the lands that nobody wanted at the turn of the century. <laughs>